Amen. Well, praise God for you this morning at the 830 experience here at Freedom Church. Excited to be in the presence of God. I realized yesterday I was going to bed or trying to go to bed. And I said, I got to get to the safest place in the world. And it's in the presence of God. And I knew that when I got to this place, I would be in the safest place in the whole wide world. Because y'all, every Sunday, we enter into the presence of God. And I thank God for a worship team and, a, and an experienced team and a production team and a Freedom Kids team and a parking team. Everybody who makes happen what happens here is so us, for it to be, for it to be possible for us to be in the presence of God. If you serve here, you don't just serve because you are at the request of somebody who wants to see certain things happening. It is a truth that when we come into this place, you never know. I just expressed to you what I came in here with today. You never know what people are coming into the house of God with. And when you serve, you serve as an opportunity to help somebody get past their pain and their problem to the promise in the person of Jesus. You're helping somebody get past their pain and their problem to the promise that occurs in the person and the presence of Jesus. And so for everybody who served today, thank you because you ministered to me. Amen. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Well, a couple of housekeeping things and then we'll get into a word. Anybody ready for a word? Amen. I think we got one. Uh, if you are a liberator, make some noise. Liberators in the house this weekend, this weekend, August 17th, we have our All Liberator meeting. And so what we need you to do is we need you to register. Somebody say the word register. Don't come, register, and then come. Because we want to plan for you. We need you. We need to know that you're going to be here so that we can plan for you. And so we need you to register so that we're ready for you. And then when you come on Saturday, let's have a good time together and then look forward to what it is that God is getting ready to do in our church as we give you some updates and information. And again, if you're nosy and you want to know what we're talking about, just come on Saturday. You should register too and then show up and hear what it is that God is doing in the house. Amen? Amen. On September the 8th, y'all, there is a special day happening in our church. It is Welcome Home Sunday. Y'all, like he said that last week, and I'm going to say it again next week because Welcome Home Sunday is huge. Listen, y'all, I was thinking about this, and I thought about the fact that people are drowning in depression and are desperate for an invitation to a solution. And if we can just give them an invitation to the presence of God, everything in their life can be changed. People are hurting. People are drowning. People are confused. People are lost. We are in a season where people are getting ready to come into the most hateful rooms and environments that they've ever been in, in, in the name of Jesus in some of these places. And we need to invite people into a safe place. Somebody shout safe. No, somebody shout safe. Our theme for Welcome Home Sunday this year is run home. And we thought about the fact that when you go and you play baseball, when you play baseball and they round that third base and they're coming home and they slide in the home almost in a desperate situation, almost like it's the last thing that they could ever do. And they make it and home play right on time, right before the opposition tries to tag them out. They make it in, they slide it in, and the umpire will with his arms wave it in and say, what? safe. And that's what we want people to do when they come to Welcome Home Sunday. That this year, this is why we got that run home theory. There are people who are rounding third base in life and desperate to get home, but the enemy is throwing everything at him, at them, and they want to throw them out. But if we can just get them in the room on September the 8th, we believe that when they slide in to this place, as desperate as they are, dirty as they might be, as hurt as they might be, sliding ain't always comfortable. But when they get here, they will be, somebody shout, safe. We need to create a safe place for the people on Welcome Home Sunday. And so you got invite cards that express way, the, for people to run home, to run home.
home. Would you take these and give them out to at least three people? Don't leave it in your seat. Take it with you and invite somebody to church on Welcome Home Sunday. Amen? Amen. Turning your Bibles to 1 John chapter number 5. 1 John chapter number 5. And we're in a series called, somebody shout, Impossible. Ooh, that was, that was weak. Maybe they're still turning or you're grabbing your invite cards. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. Let them do that over again. Somebody shout impossible. We are in 21 days of prayer, praying for the impossible. We are preaching and teaching and reading the Bible every single day on words of the impossible. And we're believing that God is going to do what only God can do. And last week, we started off this series with the title of a message that says, It Will Never Happen, or It'll Never Happen. It'll Never Happen. What will never happen? The impossible will never happen without faith. Without faith, and we learned a little bit about faith last week. We're going to continue in that vein. We're going to read First John chapter five, verses thirteen through fifteen. First John chapter five, verses thirteen through fifteen. Can I say this to you? If you got your U version Bible app, you got whatever Bible app you have, you got a paper Bible. If these verses are not underlined in your Bible after today, you need to go back, underline these in your Bible. Make sure that you have these at least committed to your heart, if not to memory. Here's what it says. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. That's good news, just that verse by itself. He, he says, I'm writing these things to those of you who believe so that you will know that you have eternal life. There's some of you in the room who wonder whether you have eternal life. There's some of you who are in the room who wonder if you're really saved. Some of you in the room who are contemplating whether or not this is something that you have actually attained. As, am I good with God? Are, are we cool? Are we okay? And he says, I wrote this book so that you can know that you and God, y'all good. Now, now there's some things that happened before this, but he said, this is why I wrote the book. He says, I wrote this so that you will know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything, somebody say anything, somebody say anything, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever, somebody say whatever. Whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. The title of my message today is taken straight from the text. It's an exclamation point or a question depending on where you are. Whatever or whatever. It's a question mark or an exclamation point depending on where you are. Whatever or whatever. A couple of months ago, uh, my best friend in the world and I were invited to do a lecture at the historic Yale University. We were invited to a lecture at the historic Yale University. We find ourselves flying into New York, catching a, cr a train up to New Haven, Connecticut. And on the night in which we got there, uh, we were hungry. And so when we get off the train, we are riding with our professor, a professor who had noted some work that we had done. She suggested that we be able to speak at this particular conference at Yale, and they accepted our, her proposal to have us go. And so we are excited to go and speak at Yale. We're excited to lecture at this particular conference conference. We get there that night. Our professor and us are all hopping off the train. We go check into the hotel. Then it's time for us to get something to eat because we've been traveling all day. And you know how it is when you're traveling all day. The thing you want to do before you go to bed is you want to find some place to eat. So night one, we get off the, the train, go to the hotel, check in. I look around the hotel because I'm used to traveling and staying in hotels. I don't see a restaurant on the first floor. So I decide we're going to take a walk because that's the type of dude I am. When there ain't nothing, nobody giving suggestions, I just start bossing people around and telling them where we're going. So I said, hey, we're going to go find some place to eat. Found out there was a Chipotle around the corner from the restaurant. My professor has very strict dietary uh, things. Ralph and I, are, Ralph is picky in the way that he eats. She's very uh, strict in what she eats, and I'm me. And so we found ourselves going to Chipotle because Chipotle has something for everybody. She's a vegetarian. He's like chicken 
can only, I got uh, my, 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 my flavor palette can be filled at uh, Chipotle. So we all just go to Chipotle, run over to the Chipotle. And usually when I go to Chipotle, I know what to expect. But this Chipotle was a little different. It's a little different. We, we stroll into the Chipotle, and I'm standing in line, and the people don't welcome to Chipotle. That ain't there. They looking at you like, you got to know what to say, what to do. I'm waiting for them to say, okay, can I take your order? What can I get for you? All oh, this is a lady kind of standing off toward the back. She looking like, well, when you ready, tell me to come up. And I'm just like, what are we doing? Then while I'm standing in line, I finally say, hey, I'm ready to order. We're ready to go. Uh, we're ready to order. She comes up, and then another dude walks up, like cut. Ralph and Dr. Body in the line stands next to me. I don't know why he came next to me and starts trying to sell me weed. Like legit, we we in the middle of the, of the, of the deal. He's like, yo, bro, you look like type of brother. You like to have a good time. <laughs> he starts trying to sell me weed. So while he's trying to sell me weed, I'm sitting there saying to myself, lady, if you don't make my bowl as fast as you can so I can get out of here, I'm trying to entertain the brother because I don't know how crazy he is. You know how that go. Like if the dudes start flipping and I got to start fighting, then it's like the headline is young uh, pastor trying to go to a Yale conference to speak ends up in jail. I just always read the headline in my mind. It's just I know because I'm a fight. I'm just going to be honest with y'all. Y'all need to know who your pastor is. I'm going to fight. Like, I'm not going to let him swing on me and then be like, oh, my God, in the name of Jesus. No, I'm going to whoop him, and I'm going to be in jail, and then y'all are going to be like, well, what happened to Pastor? Well, he told us he was going to fight. So I'm trying to de-escalate the situation because I, I hadn't told y'all this yet. So y'all would have been shot. Now I'll just fight next time. Just kidding. <laughs> But, but so what happens is we eat the Chipotle, very disappointed, because it wasn't good. The wet, lettuce is soggy, all this. The next day, we got to eat again. The next day, we got to eat again. And so we get out, and in the middle of the night, we, we leave in the conference. We take a walk around the neighborhood again, and there are no meatless options. There's a lot of, like, ethnic foods and different stuff. I'm game, but I told you I got a picky friend and a dietary restricted professor. And, and they're looking at me like, man, there ain't nothing there. So we ride back to the hotel, and I go to the front desk. And I told you, there's no, no, no restaurant like it is in a, normal rest, in a normal hotel on the first floor. And I say, hey, man, we're looking for some type of place to eat, but we can't find a place that fits her dietary needs and what he wants. And I'm pretty open. And he says, well, sir, you're staying here, right? I say, yes. I say, yeah, I'm staying on the 15th floor. He said, well, listen. If you need something that deals with her dietary needs and his uh, stuff and what you want, you guys just need to go up to floor 20. There's a restaurant above you. He said, he said there's a restaurant above you. He's like, and, and they can custom make whatever it is that she needs. So if she's got vegan needs, they can give it to her. And what you're saying, he wants to eat. We've got plenty of that. The point I'm trying to make is I was wrestling in on the streets, trying to find something to eat, dealing with the weed, man, almost getting into a fight, simply because I never asked what was available. And when I asked what was available, right on the next level of where I was living was a blessing. Y'all missed it. On the next Next level of where I was living was something that was good for all of us. And I believe that's how many of us are living today. You're dealing with the stresses and the struggles of life, and it doesn't mean you won't go through them. But some of us are doing it unnecessarily. That on the next level of your life, if you would just ask, God has a miracle. There is more available to us in our Christian life. We just need to ask for it and access it. That there is more available to us in our Christian life. We just need to ask for it and access it. I'm going to say it one more time because this is the point of the message. If you go to sleep, you're going to miss how to ask for it, but you'll at least have this. There is more available to us in our Christian life. We just need to ask for it and access it. Last week, last week, we discovered that God can and wants to do the impossible in the life of of his people. We, we discovered that God can and wants to do the impossible in the life of his people. This is important because not only can God do it, but God wants to do it. And the reason why this is important is because once we establish the character of God, we now have to ask ourselves, what steps are we to take? Because God can and wants to do this in the life of his people, we got to ask a quick question in recap, who are his people? And we said last week that the people of God are the ones living 
by faith in God made possible by Jesus. I'm giving you some stuff from last week because I realize we forget and we need reminders. The people of God are the ones living by faith in God made possible by Jesus. And it is without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so when we look at, at, at what John is speaking to us today, John is giving us some insight as to how we access and utilize this faith that has been made possible in Jesus. This letter or sermon, really, that John is writing to the believers in the first century is meant to be an encouragement for them to remain faithful to the gospel that they were given. There are several issues that are facing this church that John is writing to. Several issues that are attacking or undermining their faith. There are Jews who are now believing in Jesus and being thrown out of the synagogue. If you don't understand anything about Jewish life, the synagogue was a central part of their community. It was a central part of their theology. It's a central part of their identity. So the central part of their community and their theology and their identity, they're being thrown out because they're declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. Not a non-Jewish concept. The Jews just didn't want to hear it about Jesus. The Messiah was the one that they were waiting on, but the Jews just didn't want to hear it about Jesus. So these Jews are being thrown out of the synagogue. They're being rejected by the people they were raised with because they have a non-traditional view of God. They're being thrown away because they don't do things the traditional way. And I know there are some of you who are in the room today who maybe faced a time or two, especially hanging out with your boy, where you don't do things the traditional way. And there are people who claim to love God that will ostracize you because your faith doesn't look like what they think it should, but it's still faith in Jesus. Another issue that they're facing is false teachers are creeping into the church and teaching some weird things like, Gnosticism. Gnosticism is, is the theory or the, the doctrine that, that the, the material world is evil and only the spiritual world is good. And so they, they almost had this, this thought that Jesus could not have come in the flesh because the material world is evil. And if he had come in the flesh, there is no material thing that is good. So if Jesus came in the flesh, he had to be evil. And then they, they would say that you had to attend to some higher gnosis or knowledge in order to fully understand what Jesus and who Jesus really was. And so the Gnostics are coming in saying Jesus didn't come in the flesh. The Docetists are coming in and saying that Jesus was, was, was uh, appearing like he was in the flesh, but he never really was in the flesh. And John is saying, I saw him with my own eyes. I touched him. I ate fish sandwiches with this dude. I hung out with this guy. The Bible says several times that John would lay his head on the chest of Jesus when they was kicking it in the suppers that they were having. The Bible says, John says, that which I have seen and heard and touched with my hands, I'm testifying to you. John is writing this book to let you know I witnessed him in the flesh. And there are people who might try to tell you that Jesus did not exist and I witness after eyewitness has expressed that Jesus did live. And here's the thing, although we did not see him in the flesh, the song we sang reminds us that we've seen him move. Even though we've not seen him in the flesh, we've seen him answer prayer. Even though we might not have seen him in the flesh, we've seen him keep his promises. John is writing to a group of people who are also facing persecution. Persecution is widespread, and so compromise starts to creep in. People start wanting to do things that would cause them to not be abused or abandoned, persecuted or talked about. And so what happens is they begin to take their faith and adjust it, turn it down, dial it down. And they say, well, just so that I don't get persecuted, I'll act like I'm with the Roman imperial court and I'm not with Jesus. And I know that there are people in the room maybe ashamed to say it, and I'm not trying to shame you by saying it, but when you get to work, your faith is dialed down. That when you with certain family members, you dial your faith down just because you don't want to hear their mouths. You don't want to deal with the ridicule. You don't want to deal with what it is that they've said. And John says, can I write to you to give you faith and confidence? That you don't have to turn down your belief in Jesus. John writes this book, and some of the key themes are confidence. When you read the book of 1 John, he uses the word confidence several times because he wants you to know what it is that you believe. And when he gets to the conclusion of the letter, it's only five chapters. You can read it in about 25 minutes if you just sit down. The truth. 
The truth of the matter is, John says, I got to summarize what it is that I've told you. And he gives us some things that he wants you to take into a culture that is anti-God. He says, while it's uncomfortable, the things that are impossible are still possible with Jesus. He said, while it may be uncomfortable, the things that are, that are impossible are still possible with Jesus. And he gives us these three verses that not only give us confidence and hope, but I will argue, give us a plan for how to see the impossible in our lives. If you're ready to take notes, I need you to write these down. If you're not taking notes, write these down. The first thing that John tells us to do is abide. Abide, abide to continue, to dwell, to stay. John tells us first to abide. Where do you see that in the text, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Here's what he says. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. John says, specifically, I'm going to tell you who I'm writing to. John specifically says who this is for. Now, before I move on, I need for you to understand that this formula that I'm about to give you is also a formula that is for a specific group of people. If you walk out of here and you don't fit the bill of who I'm about to tell you this is for, you cannot claim these promises, then go back and say that God did not do for you what the pastor said he could. John says this is for a set group of people. This is for a specific group of people. And while you're in the room, it does not make you the exclusive group. I, I think the problem is, for many of us, we think that because we're in the room, we get every promise. You get to hear them, and you get to respond to them, but it doesn't mean you get them. You have to do something about it. And here's what John says. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. John says that this particular promise is for those who believe. This particular promise is for those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This particular uh, formula is for those who have accepted the fact that they are not enough on their own, but they have come to Jesus and given him their life because without faith it is impossible to please God because the one who comes to him must first believe that he exists and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Here's what John is saying. It is for the belief that this promise is active. It is for the believer. And here's the good news. Everyone can be a believer. John, John doesn't make it exclusive to a social, a social status. John doesn't make it exclusive to a group of people who, who, who had a certain upbringing. John doesn't make it exclusive to an ethnicity or a race. John says, all you got to do is believe in the name of the Son of God. And I am going to say in every week of this series on the impossible being made possible that the first thing you need to do is align yourself with the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. And that if you believe that, you get eternal life. He says... I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know. Somebody say no. So that you may know that you have eternal life. The way that we access eternal life, John is saying, is through our belief or our faith. He's saying that we access eternal life through our faith. It is when we believe in the Son of God that we have eternal life. I said, Pastor, what does that got to do with abiding? Eternal is forever. I say, well, you're so smart. <laughs> E eternal is forever. And John is saying, I need for you to understand that what you've entered into, you need to rest in. That what you've entered into is eternal life. When you gave your life to Jesus, you said that after this life, Jesus, I trust you with the next life, and I'll live with you forever. And he says, and I need for you in this life to remain in that. I, I need for you to abide in that. The question that we have to ask ourselves, though, is what is John's idea of eternal life? Yes, it deals with life after death. Because after we die, there is another life after this one that you need to settle up and understand and know what's going to happen. I know people don't like to talk about this in church anymore, but the truth of the matter is one out of every one person's going to die. If Jesus don't return, one out of every, I mean, that's a good stat right there for you to realize, that one out of every one person is going to die. And the question is, what's going to happen after this life? And the Bible says that if we place our faith in Jesus, we get another shot at eternal life. 
And that means life after death, but that's not all it means. See, life after death is quantitative. That, that means that it's a quantity of life. That means it's an unlimited amount of life. That means it's life never ending. But eternal life in the Greek, whenever the New Testament, the words aionios zoe, which means eternal life, are paired together, it is also meaning a qualitative life. Y'all like, man, he going to professor mode. Let me try to break it down. That a quantitative life means a quantity of life unlimited. But eternal life in the New Testament is not just quantitative or long life after death. It's not just living forever in heaven. It's having a quality of life on earth. There should have been three more people that got excited about that because what Jesus offers you is not just some high pie in the sky in the by and by. <coughs> After this life, I'll live with him forever. <coughs> he says you can live in a better quality of life even now. John 10.10, 10, the Lord said to us, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I am come that you may have life and have it to the full. Greatest problem that we have is that we're not living the full lives that Jesus has called us to. Eternal life in Christ goes back and erases my past, goes forward and secures my future, and shows up and improves my present. I'm going to say that again. Y'all need to get this. Eternal life in Christ goes back and erases my past. That means the consequences of what it is that I've done no longer keep a record in heaven, and one day I will be able to live with him because he erased my sin. It goes forward and secures my future. There is a place in heaven made for me, eternal, not made with hands. There is a home that God has for me in heaven. He goes and secures my future. But this is where we mess up. We miss the fact that now is in the middle of eternity. He gives me eternal life, which means there's no beginning and there's no end. It's eternal. He goes back and fixes the past. He goes forward and secures the future, but he also improves my now. And if you give your life to Jesus, there should be some better days in your now. Doesn't take away consequences, doesn't take away suffering, but what it does do is improve how I deal with this stuff. There should be some better days. In my now. So then what do, how do I get these better days if I abide? John chapter 15, verse 7 says this. Watch what the text says. If you remain, somebody say remain. remain. One translation says abide. If, if you abide in me, if you remain in me, and my words abide or remain in you. Watch what he says. Ask whatever. Whatever? Or Whatever. See, see, the problem is many of us are still living with the question mark because we don't believe the scripture. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, abide. Ask whatever. I mean, whatever. Ask whatever you wish. Put the word desire in there and it will be done for you. John is giving us a formula as to how we get the impossible in our lives. He said the first thing you got to learn to do is you got to learn to somebody shout abide. John, 1 John chapter 2 in verse 19, John, it's not going to be on your screen, but I'll read it. He says, watch this, that there are some people who, who never accomplish what it is that God had for them. And here's the reason why. Listen to this carefully. He says they're not going to get it. They're not going to be in eternity with you. They went out from us. But they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. And here's what he's saying. A true believer, those who believe in the name of the Son of God, will abide in the name of the Son of God. Will remain in the Word of God. Will remain in the faith. They ain't dropping out every time it gets tough. They ain't quitting every time things look rough. Every time things don't go their way, they're not questioning whether or not they need something new. If Christ is really in you, you ain't walking away from him because you know he ain't leaving you. He says if you want to get the impossible, you got to learn how to abide. Here's what God ain't going to do. Bad grammar, good theology. Here's what God ain't going to do. Give a whole bunch of impossible to people who ain't probable to stay. 
That the impossible happens when we settle in our minds that no matter what I'm going through, no matter what I see, no matter what I'm doing, no matter where I've been, no matter what it looks like, no matter what they say, I will remain in him. I know that's tough, but the truth of the matter is, y'all, our faith is flailing because we don't know how to have it under fire. And God says you got to learn how to remain. Watch this. Remaining means I spend time in the presence of God. Notice that John 15 says I remain in him and I remain in his word and his word in me. The more time I spend seeking God, the more I begin to see what it is that God desires for my life. Y'all have read Psalm 37, 4 before. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And we even know the true context of this, that as long as I spend time with God, he begins to give me my desires. I don't just get what I want, but he begins to give me my desires. The problem is you read that verse, and you didn't read the verse before and after. This is how you get what it is that God has for you. Read, uh, go to verse 3. Go back to verse, verse 3. Trust in the Lord. Tr trust in the Lord and do good. I'm coming back to that one. Dwell. Remain, yeah. abide, yeah. stay yeah. in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Here's the problem. The land didn't look good to you, so you decided to move. And the Lord says, I know it looked uncomfortable, but I knew what I was getting ready to provide. Stay in the land. What's the land in the 21st century? Stay in the church. Stop running every time something happens. You know what the biggest problem with believers are? When life hits, they run from the place where God has provided safe pasture. He says, dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Verse 4, take delight in the Lord. Well, how are you doing that if you're running from God? The two scriptures are connected. Stop saying, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart if you stop coming to church. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Verse number five. Commit your way to the Lord. Here it is. Trust in him, and he will do this. Now, now this ain't happened yet, because there's a semicolon. I mean, there's a colon. There's a colon. There's a colon. I, I was hot on the semicolon that you preached yesterday. There's a colon. So that this ain't yet been revealed. You can say, trust, commit your way to the Lord and trust in him he would do this and go back to verse 4 and claim a promise God ain't given. Because you read your Bibles. Now what is the thing that God's going to do? Verse 6. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Why did I go to that verse? Y'all can say, that don't make no sense. I don't think they ain't saying nothing about it. Abide. No. I say, you got to remain and give safe pasture, commit your ways to the Lord, and he will do this. And then I read this. Here's the reason why I'm telling you. It may look like you're not winning in the pasture that God has you in, but God says if you remain, if you commit, if you delight, and you take his desire, He's going to vindicate you. And the problem is, so many of us quit before the day of vindication. So many of us quit before the day when God shows up to give us what it is that he promised. When the book says he's going to vindicate you, that means there is something that is opposing you. There is something trying to take you out. And the reason why you need to learn how to abide is because God says, I know there's an enemy. I know it's tough. I understand that this does not look good. But if you trust in me, if you remain in me, if you commit to me, I'll vindicate you. You know what I like about vindication? Uh, we go to a court of law and they, and, they, and they give vindication and recompense to people who have money stolen from them that the person who stole it got to pay it back with interest. And the Lord told me to tell somebody that if you would just remain, if you would just abide, if you would just stay, if you would just dwell, if you would just commit, if you don't leave, if you remain in his presence, that when he vindicates you, not only will you get back the peace the enemy stole, but the prosperity that the Lord had on top of it is coming. I wish I had three or four people in the room who would say, I'm going to abide because what's coming is greater than what I lost. I got to move quickly. We got a few more minutes and four more points. Here it is. John says the first thing you got to do is you got to abide. Somebody say abide. abide. The next thing you got to do is, this is simple, ask. You got to ask. I mean, this seems simple, but this is the text. 
The Bible says that I write these things to you, those who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And we talked about eternal life. We talked about the fact that it's eternal. It, it abides. We need to abide. But he says this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask, that, that, that if we feel, that if we desire, that if we think it, See, here's the thing about the believer is that if God knows everything, we want to put everything on God. Well, he already knows what I'm thinking. He already knows what I've been dealing with. Why don't God just show up and do it? And the thing that comes out of your mouth is not the ask, it's the complaint. And so what we have is a heaven bombarded with complaints and no requests. What we have is a heaven that is full of complaints. And the angels who are, who are conditioned to worship God alone, when they are sent out to minister to you, they have nothing to work with. Because all they hear is complaints. And the last time in heaven, they saw somebody who tried to rebel against God, they lost eternity. The other angels who follow Satan out of heaven, they find themselves in a terrible condition. And these angels are looking and saying, I'm not following no complaints. I'm waiting for praise and requests. The Bible says that there are ministering angels set out to minister on the behalf of the saints, but they are locked in because of your complaints. You have not asked heaven, you're complaining about your circumstance. As though heaven does not already know what's going on. What the Lord is waiting for is a person who has faith enough to say, God, you're the only one that can fix this. You're the only one that can change this. Here's what I'm asking. God is looking for somebody who's willing to ask. I've been seeing a disturbing trend on social media lately. Uh, I'm a church boy and a church nerd. No lie, if you go to my algorithm, it's worship and preaching and right now the Olympics. It's worship and preaching and right now the Olympics. Here's the thing. So when I go and I watch preaching, I look in the comments because I like to see what people are saying. Are you tracking with the preacher? Or if the preacher ain't tracking with the Bible, are you tracking with the preacher? And <laughs> I just need to know where people are. And so there are times now I'm seeing this disturbing trend on social media. That I'm watching preachers who are preaching the gospel and, and people are in the comments going crazy and scammers are showing up in the comments. And what the scammers are doing is they're showing up and saying, hey, I made $8,500, glory shalom to Yahweh, that, that this is what it did for me. And people are in the comments missing the message, replying, help me with that, help me with that, help me with that, help me with that. And the scammers are winning because the people of God are refusing to listen to the word of God, but they rather listen to a get-rich-quick scheme. The saddest part about it is not what I just said, is that the scammers know that the believer won't go to the God they say they trust. So they jump in the comments and trick you because they know you don't trust him. They jump in the comments. The scammer knows that the same people who are listening to a message about a God who owns a cattle on a thousand hill don't believe that God will do it for them. So instead of them asking God how they should pursue what it is that's going on in their finances, it's easier for a scammer to slide in and say, hey, if you really want this money, skip this stuff you've been shouting on and come get this scam. I believe that the devil's been working this way for centuries. That the problem is he's gotten believers so sidetracked with what it is that we can see, what we can touch, and what we can have right now that what we failed to do is learn how to ask God for what we need. That we have put ourselves in a position where, we, where now we do not ask God. And it's so crazy that these people who are in the comments are telling them, this is what you can have. This is what's going to happen. And they don't even sound like they're believers. They use crazy terms. Like I told you, they're like, glory to shalom. I had $75,000 that I made last month and I bought a house here in the U.S. Who says that? You know it's some foreign uh, scammer. Talking about, I bought a house here in the U.S. Who says they bought a house here in the U.S.? But people are believing it because we're refusing to check with God. And here's what Jesus has been saying from the beginning. He says, if you would open up your mouth and begin to ask me for what it is that you need, I promise you I'll ask, I'll answer you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says this. Matthew 7, 7. Ask. This is Jesus. Ask, and it will be 
given to you. Let's keep reading. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Can I take that first independent clause? Ask, and it'll be given. Ask, and it'll be given. Can I read something else for you in the book of James? Can I read for you what James says? James chapter 4, verse 2. Look at James chapter 4. You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You, you covet, but cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Next verse. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Run the verse back. Go back to verse 2. Let's work it real quick. You, have, you don't have it because you don't ask, but watch what James starts with. You desire but do not have, so you kill. And I need you to see something. Notice that James does not demonize desire. James is not demonizing your desire. He says, you have a desire. And when you have a desire, but do not have, you will, you're willing to kill somebody to get what you want. He says, your improper placement of your desires has caused your sinful nature. That what it is that you want, if you don't bring it to the Lord, I promise you it's going to overwhelm you. You remember the first sin? Eve looks at the fruit, the tree that says uh, it was good for the eyes and good for food. And she saw that it was good to make one wise. She took of his fruit and she ate it when the Lord told her not to. God says, all you had to do is bring that desire to me. I'd have given you everything you needed. God says, you don't have because you don't ask. You covet and you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. There are people in this room right now who are in a perpetual fight with people in your life that you can't agree with, that you don't get along with. I just don't bang with them anymore. We just don't roll like that anymore because you couldn't get what you wanted out of the relationship. And here's the problem. What you desire, you should have went to God for. They never were meant to give it to you anyway. James says it plainly, like Jesus says, says, ask and it will be given to you. James, the little brother of Jesus, lived in the house, head to toe, sleeping in the bed together, says, you do not have because you didn't ask. And my big brother said, if you ask, he'll give it to you. And I'm telling you today that the problem that many believers have is that we're not asking. Point number three, point number three, point number three. After you, after you abide and after you ask, here's what I need you to do. I need you to align, align, align. Because some of y'all are like, bet, got a list, God, ready to ask. God says, I dare you to ask, but I need you to ask for the right thing. You remember how James ended verse three? He says, the reason why you don't have is because you ask for wrong motives so that you can spend on your own pleasures. He says, you're not aligned with the glory and the will of God. He said, there's an alignment issue. Notice this, notice this. Th this is the confidence that we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will. I, I, don't, I don't get to just ask and be outside of the will of God. C come here, come here. You can't ask for somebody else's spouse while you got a spouse and ask God to. Can, can, I, can I go further? Y'all gonna hate me now. Y'all gonna hate me now. Uh, you can't violate the principles of scripture. You out doing everything the Bible tells you not to do. And they'll be like, well, I'm asking God for the impossible. No, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, seek you first. Read it. Put it up there. Matthew 6, 33. Matthew 6, 33. Watch. But seek first. The reason why I got to bring this up, because last week we got all excited about the fact that we were seeking God while everything was in front of us and seeking God while everything is in front of us. And God turned it around and everybody shouted, seek first the kingdom of his God, or, or the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Watch this. And, 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 not or. I mean, if you can get around to it, you can start doing the will of the Lord. If you get around to it, you can start aligning yourself with the principles of Scripture. Nope. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That means I can't do life the way that I want to do it. Say that I have eternal life. Eternal life means I've called Jesus Lord, which means there got to be a change in my behavior. there got to be a change in my thought process. I have to align myself with the word of God. 
Can I tell you something? Uh, I got, I got, I'm in the electric vehicle world now. And, uh, and I was looking up the fact that I was like, you know, I don't have to get an oil change. I don't have to get a transmission uh, flush. I don't have to get any of those things anymore because there's just an electric battery underneath my car. But I thought about it and I said, but what about a wheel alignment? Because you know what happens when you're not aligned, your car starts to drift and it, it becomes unsafe to drive. And so I looked it up and, and it said that although the electric vehicle does not have all of the components that the other cars have, which cause them to go out of alignment quicker because you don't have all of those components, they've been removed from the car. Eventually, the car has a tendency to go out of balance and you still need, although not as often, an alignment. Can I talk to those of you who are saved? While the Lord has erased all of the sin of your past and you don't need alignment as often as you used to, you can't just walk into the will of God and say to yourself, I can ask for whatever I want because I'm a Christian now and the way that I don't know, you still got a flesh that likes to rise up and it may not do it as often, but you still need an alignment. It may not show up like it used to, but you still need an alignment. And every now and again, I need believers to understand that you got to align yourself with the will of God because alignment puts us in the place where God actually hears what it is that we're saying. Notice this. The word of God keeps, helps align us with the will of God so that what is suggested in your prayers is not something that is contrary to his promise. And the text says this. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, watch, he hears us. He hears us. Here's the last, here's, here's the next point that, that we need to not only align, we need to anticipate. We, we need to anticipate. The Bible says if you ask anything according to his will, he hears you. Now, now it's not like he hears you because his ears work. It's not, it's not he hears you because he's got, he's got something uh, uh, working in his, in his ears. He's got a cochlear implant, and now he can hear your prayers all of a sudden because his, his hearing got better. When we hear he hears us, it's saying that he hears us favorably. It's like me and Marcus having a conversation, and, and he makes a point, and I say, oh, I hear you, dog. Oh, I hear you. I hear you, dog. I, I hear you. You know what I'm saying? Oh, no, no. Not, not, only, not only did I hear what you said, I'm tracking with you. I, I agree with you. That, that now, when, when you ask anything according to the will of God, when you abide, ask, and align, God says, oh, I hear you, dog. God says, God says, not only, not only did I hear what you're asking for, not only I see that it's aligned with my will, oh, I'm in agreement now. The Bible talks about the principle of agreement so many times in the scripture. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20, Matthew chapter 18, verse 19 and 20, the Bible says this about you agreeing with, with somebody else that's in belief. He says, again, I tell you the truth. If two of you, if two of you on earth agree, about anything they ask for. Again, truly I tell you that if any of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Now watch this. This is two of you. Now the you, the you are believers, which means there's a witness to the will of God and you're probably going to be asking in the will of God. But God says this is how powerful the ask is, that when the two of you ask on earth, this is why you should come to prayer. This is why you should show up to prayer at least one time during the 21 days because the Bible says if you open up your mouth and ask with another believer, I'll give it to you. But, but notice this. My point is not about you two praying. I mean, I, I'm trying to make a point with this point, but, but the point is not about that. The point is that when he says he hears us and he hears us favorably, he says, I hear you, dog, and I agree. Y'all slow, but y'all worth waiting on. The Bible says that if two of you agree, anything can happen. What happens when God agrees? When God agrees, not only is it no longer impossible, it's probable. It's about to happen. What's my point? Anticipate it. If I'm praying the will of God, if I'm praying what it is that God wants for my life, if I'm praying what it is that God desires and God is in agreement, there is no devil in hell that can stop what it is that God is about to do. There is no doubt in my mind that God is getting ready to do it. I'm preparing for what it is that God said he's going to do. I'm anticipating what it is that God said he's going to do. The reason why we don't get excited because we don't know how to find the will of God. And I'm going to give you an easy one. It's found in his word. 
It's found in his word. The text says that if he hears us, watch this, we have what we've asked for. Now, here's where you really read your Bible too fast. The same word have is the same word that says we have. I write to you these things who believe, to you who believe in the Son of God so that you know that you have eternal life. John says, just as sure as you saved is as sure as he's going to answer your prayer. <laughs> if you could just get it in your head that Christ really saved you, if you could just get it in your head that you actually have this salvation, if you could just get it in your head that he really has given you eternal life, that's the same confidence you'll have that when you ask according to his will, you have what he has. I'm living in anticipation that one day when I close my eyes for the last time, I'll wake up in glory. That's anticipation because I know I have eternal life. But you know what the Lord told me? He said, just as sure as you are that one day you'll wake up in heaven, Robert, I need you to wake up and realize that when you're praying for a building, you have it. When you're praying for deliverance, you have it. When you're praying for healing, you have it. If it's in alignment with my will, just as sure as you say you say is as sure as you can say you have what you asked for. You got to anticipate it. My, my daughters, my daughters help me understand this because I understand God's brand is to answer prayers. His brand is to answer prayers. And when they were younger, Della, they used to like these things called LOL surprises. Oh, I, I know y'all know about this. The LOL surprise. And what would happen is I would go to the store. And they would say, can we get LOL surprises? And I knew how to reward them when I came home from Target. I'd just go grab a couple of LOL surprises. And i get these little balls. We don't know what's in them. We don't know what it is. That's why it's called a surprise. And here's what they would do. They would get excited when they saw the little ball. They ripped the plastic off, twist the cap off, and open it up and get excited about whatever. They, they, they would rip the plastic off and twist the cap, and, and they would get excited about whatever was in there. Why? Because they understood that it was an LOL, and anything that the LOL had, they wanted. Anything that the LOL had, they anticipated that it was good. Matter of fact, if somebody said it was bad because it was from the LOL, they believed that it was good. And I got to tell somebody in the room that you need to treat God like my daughter's treated the LOL surprise doll, that when you start praying, whatever he answers, Whatever he says, whatever he gives you, it's good. You ought to be in anticipation. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what you see. I don't care what you think. But whatever. <laughs> whatever. The problem is, Brandy, when I would bring home a bootleg brand, they had the same anticipation because that brand don't necessarily have the reputation. And the reason why our anticipation is low is because the thing you place your faith in is reputation is low. You put your faith in the reputation of your job. You put your faith in the reputation of the relationship. You put your faith in the reputation of those other than God. If you would just get back on brand, God answers prayers. And whatever he gives, I'll be satisfied with it. It'll change the way you move. Fifth point, final one. I promise I ain't talking because this is for next week. The last thing you got to do is you got to act. I need you to come back next week and we'll talk on this principle. Do something. Next week's message, we're going to see if you want to see the impossible, you're going to have to do something. I'm closing and I need everybody to hear me. I was watching the Olympics yesterday because that's what I do in this season. And I was anticipating... I was anticipating the closing ceremony. But as I anticipated the closing ceremony, it was different than the opening ceremony because the U.S. has more medals than any other country in the world. And so as I go into the opening ceremony, I, I knew that I had pride in what it is that we could do. But going into the closing celebration, I'm going to worship, I mean, I'm going to watch it differently because it's already done. I'm going to watch tomorrow, worship tomorrow, I'm going to watch tomorrow 
with a different level of anticipation because it's already done. Can I ask you not to come in here next week with the same praise you came into this week? I just gave you the formula for how God wants to do the impossible in your life. And you got to come in here like it's the closing ceremonies of the Olympics. And what you asked for is already done. You worship like he's already healed your body. You worship like he's already fixed your marriage. You worship like the finances have already been provided. You worship because it's all ready done. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I need for you to remember what you wrote last week. And if you weren't here, we took cards and we wrote what we believe the impossible to be. And we said, God, we need you to do the impossible in our lives. And as God is doing the impossible in our lives, here's the thing I want you to do. I want you to remember what that impossible thing is. Or if you didn't write anything, I need you to grab a hold of it in your mind today. And I need you to take these five things that we talked about. That you'll abide, you'll ask, you'll align, you'll anticipate, and you'll act. So that we can't say, God, it's your fault it did not happen. God says, no, this is the confidence that we have. That whatever we ask according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, we know that we have what, we, what it is that we have asked for. I need you to take that impossible now, and I need you to take it and align it with this formula that John gives us for the confidence that we have in God. And realize that you could be living on another level, waiting for whatever it is that God has for you. There's another group of people in the room that are very important. And I need for you to get this. We started this message talking about abiding in the word of God, that we are believers and we have eternal life. There's some of you in the room and you are in the room because God wants to remind you that being in the room doesn't mean you're in eternal life. That God wants to go back and in Christ, he wants to erase your past, secure your future, and improve your now. But what you have to do is you have to say, Jesus, I'm fully surrendering to you. Today is the day for you to make that choice. And I know that you walked down the aisle when you were seven years old in the church you were in, but you didn't know what you were doing. Let's be real. Today is a day where I'm making a very clear call for you to say, Jesus, my life is yours. You can have it. This is what I'm asking you to make a decision on today. Not if you've ever been in church, got baptized, or said you believed in God. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Today is the day. I'm passionate about this because I want to see you in eternity, but I also want to see the improvement God has for your life now. If that's you, on the count of three, you get the chance today to make a bold step of faith. A bold step of faith means that you don't care what it means to what your grandmama and them say about the salvation that you got at that church when you were six years old. You understand that this is your eternity. And I want you to raise your hand on the count of three and give your life to Jesus. Surrender it or recommit it in the name of Jesus. One, is the greatest decision you can ever make. Two, only the enemy would keep you from doing this. Three, lift your hand right now in this room. If you're here, you want to give your life to Jesus, recommit your life to Jesus, surrender your life to Jesus. Say, today I'm making a conscious decision to surrender my life to the Lord. If that's you in this room, that's you in this room. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, I'm grateful for everyone in the room who says that they know you. And so, God, I pray that the promises that we have preached are applicable to them. And I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that if there is any hiccup in the process, they would not blame your word, but they would check their hearts. And as they check their hearts, God, they would abide. They would keep on asking. They would align themselves with your word, anticipate what you're going to do, and act in accordance to what you tell them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, give God some praise in this room. If there's anybody in the room who needs to give their life to Christ, even after this moment, you can see Jaslyn in the corner and let her know that I'm starting a journey with Jesus and I need those resources that you have. God bless your freedom family.